Sashul's a question which I Mr. Schultz, uh, the question I want to ask you is the question that I asked you in the beginning. Uh, I had the good fortune of attending a derivatives class by somebody associated uh, with you, uh, Professor Mike Gibbons uh, uh, mm -hmm. at the Wharton School. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways Professor Gibbons uh, ends his derivatives class is by the topic, how to win a Nobel Prize, mm -hmm. and where you know, <laughs> your work gets discussed and how you know, you all brought concepts from physics, you know, thermodynamics, math, and very different disciplines into finance. And I really want to understand, you know, what was the creative process behind it? Like, you know, finance was finance, but you thought of something very different from what other people were looking at finance. Yeah. Thank you for that question. You know, I always have my relatives give me the good questions to <laughs> ask in the audience. Actually, it's interesting that, um, Science is interesting, you know, the idea in life is finding a problem that's exciting to you or me, and I found problems that were exciting. Options was very exciting because it was the third leg in my thinking. Here we had talked about what is risk management. Risk management is diversification, and Bill Sharp and Markowitz and others had talked about, Tobin talked about diversification. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, you know, that's diversification, or the effects of diversification on risk management crucial. The second area was we know reserves, the idea that if you take more reserves, it's the second area. So for example, in 97, when China almost lost all of its uh, reserves, and Thailand did lose its reserves, at that uh, their risk management was to rebuild reserves so that they would have enough reserves to withstand shocks, a drawdown. But no one had done uh, research. The research was very incomplete. And what I thought was the third leg, which is insurance, the, the option, you know, the flexibility, the idea of figuring out flexibility. So I wanted to tackle and had worked on that. Fisher Black and I talked about it a long time, thinking about that problem, but the idea of how to insure the downside. And obviously, a put option uh, is an option which protects the downside. If you own a common stock and you buy a put, which is the right to sell that common stock, that act, that is the perfect liquidity provider in the market because if the value of the asset falls, the value of your put goes up and basically you're out of that particular security so you've provided yourself a liquidity protection, perfect liquidity protection. So then that's the first thing. That's a problem that I want to solve. But then the pure scientist, the best scientist takes the tools from anywhere they can to try to solve that problem or address that problem. The problem, a lot of problems with academics, not because I was an academic and am an academic still, I mean I still can be going to schools and they, they like me there so I'm not saying this in a negative way, uh, is that sometimes the tools look for a problem to solve as opposed to the problem looking for the tools to solve the problem. You know, I can be the, I can have, get all my, go to the store and buy the best hammer and saw and chisels and all the other things to build my house, right? But you wouldn't want me to build your house, I'm sorry, even with all these tools that I have. Because the problem I'd address is completely wrong. On the other hand, um, so what I'm saying is that uh, I was lucky enough or skillful enough or just um, uh, my intuition was correct enough to try to take a problem that was, I thought was phenomenally fascinating and work on that and then find tools from physics or, what, or, or mathematics to solve that problem. And I think that's a much different way of creation in, in world. The way we create or, is really see something different of all the information we have and then trying to really figure out what to do. Because innovation is a combination of induction and deduction. You gather, you gather a lot of data. Okay, you cannot, in science you can't do anything without induction first. But the one who creates, okay, stops inducing, stops gathering data, and sees among all the data something different, that is innovation. And, and it's not the other way around, where you just, you know, you just gather tons and tons and tons of data, because the more data you gather and don't stop gathering the data, the less likely you're gonna find anything anyway. So, the creative businessman, the creative researcher, the creative anyone gathers data but knows when to stop, you know, and then to do something different. Because 
In mathematics is induction and deduction. It's integration, adding up, and differentiation. And that, that's, what, that's what innovation is. You have to have both sides of the world are, are necessary. Uh, the price of omega is low, <laughs> as we said. In other words, people are not willing to pay as much for risk transfer and liquidity services in the market today. I mean, you have um, in New York the cap rates on real estate, you know, are very very low. Uh, yield spreads are very low generally, and uh, liquidity seems to be abundant. But you know, so that's what I said before about sometimes the price of omega is low. It's My, constant. it's not constant. It'll change. I, I think the tiger is sleeping. The tiger is not tame. And some shocks will occur where we'll kick the tiger, wake the tiger up, and liquidity will disappear from the system. And governments, will, central bankers will draw some of it. Mr. Greenspan, uh, you see, I think the governments make a mistake. We need enough natural volatility. You, know, you can't keep feeding the tiger good food, you know, and the like and, and uh, without it being natural. We need enough volatility that scares people enough. We need enough noise in the channel. If it looks too pure, you know, then, then what happens, and individuals and entities take actions which may not be in their own best interest because they think their parent, uh, government, is going to protect them. But the analogy I always have in my mind, in the United States we have Yellowstone National Park, which I don't know Many of you have seen it, but it's a national treasure. And the policy of the government was to put out each fire, each fire, to put out each little fire. And as a result of putting out each fire, the underbrush grew and grew and grew. And all, one time, a number of years ago, there was lightning strikes across many parts of the park. A lot of shocks occurred across the park. And the whole park almost burned down. Okay? Now, since that time, the land management policy has been saying, nature wants fires to occur. You know, we need fires. So if, the sh if we let the fires burn out on their own, you know, maybe we can avoid the big one, <laughs> you know, where the government tries to protect us. So when Mr. Bernanke says on February 29th, you know, everything's quiet, don't <laughs> worry about anything, that may be not the best message for the government to give. So I think the governments who try to make things smoother or parents who try to make things smoother for their children to reduce volatility might not be doing the best thing because basically you want shocks to warn people. You need some noise in the channel you know, to do it and I think that could create difficulty. So sometimes when things are quiet for a long time the consequences are much larger and we, we quiescence is not necessarily good you know, because you need some volatility. Uh, and I think there's a natural amount of volatility we need that shouldn't be suppressed. I call it the X square rule. <laughs> <laughs>